the gig economy has been meandering around the conversations, and I thought you may want to know that yesterday the gentleman sitting next to you, uh, Nicolo from uh, Italy, he's a member of Parliament of Italy, he's a former intern of Millennium Project about five years ago. He is writing right now uh, it, uh, Italy's laws for the gig economy, and he's claiming that it's the first, it'll be the first draft of any country. There isn't any, right? And so he's asked me to, to review it before he submits it to the Parliament. And I would suspect that he would be just very pleased if anybody here would also like to review that draft when it's ready. You'll have to use Google Translate in front of the Italian. Um, and if at the end of this, if you give me a card and you say gig economy, I'll make sure he gets your address and, and so forth. Uh, so you can have some input into that, if you like. Uh, the second one, there was some talk with um, about the, the changing nature of the economy and also about uh, Leon talking about the use of uh, scenarios uh, in helping judgment on these things. Um, if anybody's interested, we've just produced um, three scenarios, detailed scenarios. There are 10 pages each. They're not just discussions of future conditions, cause and effect links, name, rank, and serial number in there. Um, and again, we can make these available to people. These scenarios, um, the idea was that in the Millennium Project, we we, we sent out a questionnaire before our annual meeting and say, okay, what ought we to study? And a couple of years ago, it was to take a look at the future of work. And um, we did a, a review of other people's research. And I can report to you that none of the studies, I, and I must have read at least 50, uh, none of the studies, I did keyword searches, had the phrase synthetic biology in any of them as if synthetic biology will have nothing to do with the future of work and the economy and so forth. Um, yes, amazing. All they talked about were robotics and artificial intelligence. And furthermore, they made a mess out of artificial intelligence. They confused all three together in the same paragraph sometimes. It was a mess. It was really, and, and another thing I can report to you is almost all of them, not all of them, but almost all of them looked at a single industry. <laughs> Or they looked at five years, if it was across the board. Uh, or they were within one country. But the idea of the world affecting a country wasn't in the studies I could find. Hmm. So uh, since the Millennium Project business is the global situation, uh, we said, OK, what were the questions that weren't asked? List them down. What were the questions that were answered badly? List them down. That became the basis for a real-time Delphi. So I got all that response back. People do write a lot. I'm afraid about offering to you guys because you guys are even longer winded than our guys. Are. <laughs> you know? But anyway, it's, it's a, little, a lot had to be compressed. So that would became the, 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 the basis for writing three alternative scenarios. Then I took these scenarios and sent them out again for reviews so that people would have at the scenarios. We delphied those as well. Then that, that became the final scenarios. Those scenarios, again, I can make available to anybody they want. Um, have been given to uh, node chairs around the, we have 63 node chairs in the Land Project, given to the uh, chairs around the world, and then some of them are translated in different languages. Uh, and then that, there was input to workshops. And these workshops then would make recommendations on, well, what do we do about this? And um, the, 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 the workshops were divided some were they were a little different, but in general, there were five groups. There was a, a, a business and labor group, like what should business and labor do about this? What should um, uh, government do about this? What should arts and, arts and culture do about this? Uh, what should uh, universities and education do about this? So that had a couple hundred <laughs> stuff pulled all together. Then I distilled that down to 93 actions. Those actions then went out to another real-time Delphi. Well, I think there's nine real-time Delphi's in this one study. As a matter of fact, when we you know, then then we sent those those um, suggestions, we because asking 93 questions is is not responsible. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, and so what we did, we divided them in. We said we're, we're going to do a Delphi on business, a, a Delphi on technology, a Delphi on you know so forth. So then it was you know maybe down to 
anywhere from 17 to 20, so that's a little reasonable. So then we took all of that response and we stuck and then got, got rid of the overlaps and could distilled it down and had uh, interns in the back double checking the spelling and so forth, make sure everything was okay. And we made that for our last annual meeting and that uh, also can be available to you. Um, it had in there all kinds of suggestions. And one of the things that I, uh, I, I run around the world talking about these things is to say, look, the answer is not just STEM education. Because if you go back, I'm serious, you look at all these, these studies, you can do it yourself, and when it gets, most of them don't make a recommendation, by the way, they say, these many truck drivers will be un unemployed by this year. End of conversation footnotes. And um, those that do make recommendations, they virtually all said the same thing. You gotta increase science, technology, engineering, mathematics, education. Okay, so if the workforce by 2050 is around six billion, should be higher than that because the longevity will come in, but the conservative forecast, six billion. Out of the six billion people, how many people can really make a living out of just science, technology, and mathematics education? Maybe a billion, probably less. So what about the other five billion? Right? So then anyway, so the scenarios work these things through, and you can all look at those later on. And uh, the, the recommendations are, uh, were, 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 were the 93 I mentioned. What we did with these 93 recommendations is we asked people, how feasible is this? And how, in, how effective will this action be? So that gave me tons of text, which I compressed down again. And I tried to do it, compress it down. It still got it down to about, I don't know, 100 pages or something like that. And it's useful stuff. It's useful stuff, because if you want to do X, you've got to know all the reasons why it won't work ahead of time. So you can sort of figure out how to get the strategy done. Because uh, on all of them, you had people said this is crazy, and people said this is brilliant. They had to say why. So it's really good material for people who actually want to do something. Um, so I'm going to have to package it in a nice way, maybe we can get some sponsors to make it look pretty. But right now, it's, it's dense text. Um, a, an institutional form that the Millennium Project, because this is a subject is on institutions, um, has ex been experimenting with for over 20 years now, is what we call a trans institution. A trans institution has no legal personhood. There's no such thing legally as a trans institution. Legally, the Millennium Project is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. A trans institution uh, is an alternative institutional structure to, take, to, to address some of those things that Leon was talking about, the speed of change, the diversity of the different institutional categories. Things are not just government, they're not just business, they're cutting across. So a trans institution, is an entity that does not recruit people. As few can verify, we don't go out and recruit people. Uh, we do something and it attracts people. No offense, but we did not recruit, we did not recruit you. And so the I, because as, as an organization is addressing really serious complexity, if you have to manage people, it's an impossible job. The man, I mean, to manage the Millennium Project and an objective Harvard approach, it would be an impossible job, just impossible. So, so that's one, and I say it right now because I always forget to say it at the end. You want to create an entity that attracts people. So like, let's say if you want to create a trans institution for fighting AIDS, all right, who in your country is the most interested seriously in fighting AIDS in the universities, in the business, in the government, in the international organizations and so forth. So that at, when it comes to the table, are those people who are already engaged, they're already serious, you don't have to spend any time selling them anything. All you gotta do is now you figure out what do the business people do. What, the idea is that you wanna have a system that can act through and with business, through and with academia, universities, education, through and with government, through and with international organizations, through and with NGOs, why? When, when we do something, it has to make sense to knowledge because the universities are there, they're gonna nitpick me to death if I'm, you know, if we're wrong, right? So that one, the values are there because you got your NGOs in there. The politics is there because you got some people that are dealing with government. They're making sure that's politically unfeasible for whatever reason. Um, international is there because you have UN and so forth uh, involved, international organizations. And what did I leave out? Oh yeah, yeah, they gotta make sense of the bottom line because business is there, right? So the idea is on the board, the governing board, ideally, 
is somebody from the international organizations, ambassador such and such, or PAHO such and such, or whatever, and would you have, but not a majority of anyone. So you have somebody from each of these institutional categories, <coughs> but not a majority of anyone. The people who do the work should be from all these institutional categories, but not a majority of anyone. The money, if you take a look at our website, and you look at where the money comes from, we get US Army and UNESCO. And that's about as far apart as I can imagine. Um, and we do, right? So we get money from all those different categories, but not a majority of anyone. Now what this means is that we can act through those categories when we need to. So let's say here are things out of these 93 actions on the, on the work technology thing. Well, this one can't be done by university, so you're not going to worry about it. But this one can be done by government, so you're going to worry about that. But the thing that's nice is that you guys know each other, and you can collaborate. So a trans institution almost got passed in Germany. Um, von Weizsäcker, by the way, was going to do it. But then University of California hired him away. Very annoying. Don't trust those Americans. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so as soon as a country, and, and maybe Italy, uh, coming up, or Switzerland, when they pass it, what we wanted to do is take the whatever legislation it is for trans institution, and then we'll send it to all legislatures around the world. Um, I'm enthusiastic about this because we have been evaluated by a relatively hostile audience at the UN University. <laughs> and one of the conclusions from that relatively hostile audience was we have no idea how you get all this stuff done at that budget. There's just no way you can get it all done. Right? And I'm saying the reason it is so effective per dollar is because of the organizational institutional structure. Mm -hmm. Because we can't, you know, because we're not, you know, if you said, well, you can't do this in universities, fine, so we'll do it in business. You know, it gives us tremendous flexibility. And when you think about it, we get away with murder all the time. Because uh, if it doesn't work here, then we go there. So it, 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 I, I would strongly recommend considering the idea of a trans institution as a new institutional form. So you've got for profit law, non profit law, and trans institutional law as a third category. And I think it will be attractive to people. Literally, that's the idea, is to be attractive to people. So that's one of the institutional, uh, uh, new institutional forms that I'd, I'd suggest. And the nice thing is that we've had enough years of, of doing it that we can actually tell you where it works and where it doesn't work. And that's why I stress the idea of attracting, because every time we try to recruit something, it doesn't work out well. It's much better to have your friend in Paris suggest you <laughs> than for me to run over to Belgium and say, would you please come in? Okay, another category, another institution, uh, potential institutional uh, category, it's called a, a, a telenation. A, a, a telenation is the idea that, uh, let's say you're in Cape Verde, where the first one, to my knowledge, was done. They have more people from Cape Verde out of Cape Verde than in Cape Verde. Right? Same thing with Montenegro. There's more Montenegrins outside of Montenegro than are in Montenegro. So you have all these people outside of countries who send back money. Okay, that's nice, okay, but what's about your brain power? Yeah. You have this incredible despera of, of brain power of all these countries around the world, and they, you, know, you can say, look, okay, like, I've got this new business proposal. Can, you know, Joe, who works now at the World Bank, will he give me one hour or half an hour to analyze my business proposal to tell me where I'm wrong and where I'm right and so forth? So the idea would be to take dating software, and so instead of just you know matching up dating, you're matching up development needs in the country with the outside people to do this. Uh, and uh, the way that we did this with Cape Verde was we had the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs tell the ambassadors of Cape Verde that they had these Cape Verdean sort of overseas clubs. And many countries have that, overseas clubs of Haitians and all kinds of other things like that. So the ambassador calls a meeting at the embassy. They said, would you like to become a telecitizen of your country? And so you register, you put in your skills and so forth, and somebody else in the other country, in the mess, in the, inside the country, puts down, I'm a school teacher, I don't have time to grade all these English papers. I can send these as attached file to you, can you grade these papers? Or you can you know, check the English and so forth. Or represent the product in another place. So the idea is, is very simply, is an institutional structure that would connect the brains overseas with the development process back home. It solves the language problem, it solves the culture problem, it solves the interest problems, and so forth. Because you think about how much money has been spent around the world on trying to get people to come home. 
all the programs, all those, I mean, this is, is, is I suspect it's in billions probably it's been done. What and actually, in not much impact. What was trying to actually legislate to give people five years tax free? Yeah, yeah, but just think of all that money, yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Work. And, 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 and as best I can tell, a lot of these things don't work that well. So, so cost effect, it's a failure. So here is no cost other than buying some computer dating software. There's probably a dating company probably just give the damn software to you because they can say, you know, this is by such and such company. Uh, and then you're going to do dating on the side if you want to. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so, so, <laughs> so, yeah, so that's a, 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 a second industry. A, 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 At least you don't get shared interests. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that would, no, I'm not going to go there. No, no. <laughs> Well, apparently that one will work. We don't know about the trans institution, but telemation should go. And anyway, uh, and it has been done in other countries in various other forms. Like India's got something like this and some other stuff. But, uh, but, but by calling it a telenation, it also has the other advantage that let's say I'm a tourist in Belgium. Well, Belgium doesn't need help. Uh, <laughs> let's say I'm a t tourist in, let's say, Haiti. That's a bad choice of tourism. Well, in country X, I'm a tourist. <laughs> And uh, I like the country. I like the people. Wouldn't it be nice to be connected? And here I am, this uh, architectural whatever that is. And so I'll say, hey, I'll be a tele X country. And I will look to any architectural plans need any help with. And for me, going through a CAD CAM sort of design, no big deal. Half an hour, I can double check a couple and send it back to them. And then, then, then the embassy can have these parties of tele nations and so forth and, and make it like a, a new institutional form that you've left your country, okay, big deal. But you're still part of your country's development process. You're not just buying them off by sending them a check. You can still send them a check, but send them to your brain as well. A uh, third one uh, I would stress would be collective intelligence. This also goes to the issue of speed and forewarning. Um, when I say collective intelligence, I don't mean knowledge management. Knowledge management systems is a perfectly good thing to do. I'm not knocking it. As a matter of fact, it's a good idea to start with a knowledge management system before you get to collective intelligence. What I mean by collective intelligence is it's the interaction of three elements. The human brain, the information, and the software, such that every element of the humans, every element of the software, every element of, so uh, of, of, the, of the data, information, can change each other. Information changes its meaning through time. Information also has different implications to different situations at the same time. So those are like two vectors on, on a piece of information. In a relational database, you can't quite do that. So the idea is, that every, in our system, Every piece of information, whether it's a piece of information or a method, a news article, a strategy, it doesn't matter. The bottom right-hand corner's got a little icon there for comment. So you read something and you see that it's slightly skewed this way rather than that way in your judgment. You click it on and you say, it's skewed this way because of this, and then you say it. Then on a menu on top of it, you can click and you can get all the comments on that category of information. So that somebody who put it in originally can then comment on the comment. But it's just structured on a piece of information, not on the whole thing. It's like on a, on a blog, you got the whole thing, it's a lot of, you can't search through it so easily. Um, a, one of the things that got us going on this was we did, we, had, we did a study for the Office of Science of the Department of Energy on the future science and technology. And one of the issues was uh, regulation, control, laws, and so forth on new technologies. And uh, it was pretty clear from the interaction around the world that as it gets faster and faster, uh, government regulation will look sillier and sillier, mm -hmm. okay? Now, the interest is, is a footnote for you. The people who wanted the regulation the most tended to be China. The people who wanted to have the regulation the least, surprise, surprise, United States. However, the United States respondents really was good at terrifying you. They could really tell you the problem. China didn't come up with much terrifying, but they wanted to control it. The US was terrified, but didn't want to control it. I thought that was just a little footnote just for sport. Now, so how do you control, how do you, how do you deal with this? this, this, this obviously massive difference. 
the, what came up so far was the idea of collective intelligence. The idea is that, let's say, if I am Raytheon or whoever it is, and I've got some new device, new technology coming up that's coming out, I'm interested in advertising. I want people to know what's coming up. I also can attract the best talent around the world because someone's going to come back and say, hey, by the way, you're not doing it right. We went around, we interviewed various people about what, you know, would, it, would a collective intelligence on science and technology work? Would you play? And basically everybody we interviewed, they all said, yes, we want to do that. The idea is that you would have uh, not only information about current cutting edge information, uh, technologies, but you also have the OTA sort of stuff, the what, what, what's next and what are the various, and you have a range of views, because the collective intelligence isn't telling you the truth, it's saying it's collective intelligence. What, how do I act on this stuff? Here's a range of views on this. So if you're going to pass a law in your country, you have to address this part of it, because if you address just that part of it, you're going to drive right through and it's irrelevant. But then you make it available a little bit like Wikipedia in the sense that everybody can play in some, by some structured way of reviews and that, that sort of stuff. Um, and, and information can be its own power. Uh, and where I got that insight years ago was at a charrette. I mentioned that, I think, to you the other day. The charrette is a participatory process for, for planning. It came out of this architecture in Paris and then urban planners and education and so forth. But it's basically a way you can bring together the different kinds of people. You push them through a pressure cooker several days or a week, and they come out with a new design at the end, and they have a press conference. So there's, so there's pressure to be, you're on the record. You can't just say nothing. You're on the record there. Um, and I was in, the first one I went to was on education, and it, it, it decided to plan everything else, not only just education, but urban planning in the area and so forth. And I, there's a developer in the charrette who had already done everything he's supposed to do uh, to build something or built on complex. I watched him change his mind. And he did not have to. Because he had, all the permits had been done, everything was, 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 was done. And it was only the information power, the interaction of the people and the information power, that changed the decision. Mm -hmm. I was overwhelmingly impressed by that, to the point that I said, okay, information is one of the weakest forms of social change I know. <laughs> I, I agree. But it's not ignoring, because when you have these two polars, do you, uh, do you have a law or a regulation prevents creating a black hole in Long Island? Or, or do you say, baloney, you can't understand this sort of stuff, so don't even do it? Um, I don't know how you resolve that, other than to have a system that creates its own power. It's, it, 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 you are inventing power. We're talking before about power the other day. One, my view of power, is not only the structural power, institutional, but it's also inventing power. You know, like corporate power has been invented beyond corporate, beyond government power. And eventually the indigenous power will probably be invented beyond the, the corporate power, eventually. So those are the uh, institutional comments I uh, wanted to, to share and get feedback and thoughts about. Great, thank you.